And let me, I forgot to mention when you do the striations with the first glaze, make that a little darker than the base color. So you got your base color, you got your first glaze, it's in a little bit darker tone. And then you do your third glaze, that's in a much darker tone. Then, when I was looking at this casket, it just looked like planks of wood, like big solid pieces. And so I was thinking, well, I need to separate it out. Part of whole painting is remember this. Black paint equals space. You want to have a plank, use flat black paint, and just draw a line, and you now have a plank. So flat black is space. So I add that in. Okay, so that is wood graining. What questions do I have about wood graining? Anybody has. Okay. <laughs> yeah. so you're going to have to get used to me. When I ask a question, I wait. Because it takes a while for somebody to come up with a question. So you're going to have to answer it. Do you go through to it lengthens the uh, wood grain that you drag, or do you just roll? You can drag. Do, you can totally drag to lengthen it, and then you go up like that, and you get the knot in there. You're right. It's really a lot of fun. Okay, rusty steel. You might want to guess what this is made out of? Steel. <laughs> foam. Yes, this is this is pink foam, and me just going completely crazy with monster mud one day. <laughs> I wanted to make this look like cast iron, very old, and... <laughs> and I also wanted to make a steel box, and this is a cardboard box, using the whole paint. The trick, again, is monster mud. Oh, I love monster mud. What's monster mud, Tara? <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute, I'm looking for a sample of all kinds of materials. Okay. All right, you tell me what monster mud is. Joint Pluto. compound paint. Go for it. Joint compound with latex paint mixed in. Exactly. Joint compound, and here's a picture of the joint compound that I'm talking about. And I like these three pounders. I used to get the, what, 500 pounder buckets at <laughs> That was hilarious watching me at the Home Depot thing trying to lift that into the car. It was ridiculous. So now I get these little guys. But there's all kinds of ratios for Monster Mud. I mean, I want to hear what people's favorite ratios are. Mine is five to one. What's everybody else's favorite ratios? I always use like about uh, pancake batter consistency. Pancake batter, okay, yep. Uh, that is this one here that I use. And the pancake batter one is good for base coats, I've learned. Um, I have a pancake batter, that would be three to one. So that's uh, one jar of this to 15 ounces of paint. And it's all flexible. You can go in between that, you can go more, you can go less. But remember, the less paint you have, the less flexibility. Because the paint is what gives the monster mud the flexibility. And so more paint, more flexibility. Now, is it waterproof or not? I, I want to know the answer to this. If you add enough paint, it is waterproof. It is, okay. So like if well, I would say waterproof, no. water resistant. Yeah. Water, okay. water resistant, not waterproof. Yeah. Okay. No. I think you're right because, like, see this, uh, this hedgehog thingy that I have down here? You may have saw when you're getting too much. That's using my favorite five to one, which is not very weather resistant. But I think if you don't rub it, it won't come off. It'll, it was on the, um, uh, it'll absorb moisture unless you paint with an outside paint. Okay. Like an oil base. So this is one probably absorbed it and then dried and absorbed it and dried. Right. All right. So going back to full painting rusty steel, what I did is I made this cheat board for myself because I'm always forgetting what my recipes are for things like that and also what palette I have to choose from. And so for this cardboard box, this one was a little bit different, so I'm gonna stick on a cardboard box. I painted a base of red monster mud, and this is the pancake kind of texture. This is a three to one. And I use a, a, like a rubber glove and I kind of just pop it on so I get some texture and let that dry. And it looks like this. 
And then the next step is I use my black, which is over here. And how I do that, you can start talking this way. <laughs> Like here's an example of my rust, and what I do, what I do for the black is you have this wet because you want to have your sea sponge flexible. And squeeze out the water as much as you can. And you look at your sea sponge and go, what pattern do I like? Like down here is a real feathery kind of look. Over here it's kind of chunky. I'm going to go kind of... I think feathery look kind of cool. And you kind of dip it in there like that. And you just pop it on the spaces. And what the sea sponge does is it allows peaks and valleys, just like rust does. So you kind of pop it in. And don't go like completely around. You want to add some variety to it, some kind of different textures. Like if you see here, you'll see I have like sections of lighter rust in, in different areas. So you want to have variation. Okay, so I did the black now. Assume that was black. I only want to bring one monster mud out here. Then you let that dry, and then you take silver paint. And the silver paint I like is at Home Depot. They have like Ralph Lauren. They're, they're kind of their fancy silver stuff for their houses and stuff like that. Get a gallon of that. It'll last you forever. And what you do is you dry brush. And you dip, how you dry brush is you dip a paint, you dip your brush in paint, and you dry it up really good on a paper towel, and then you just kind of rust it like this. And so now you're getting a silver finish. So we did a base color. We did black monster mud, dry brush silver, and now you're going to come back in and you're going to start adding some textures and some colors to give it some depth and texture. And so now we're going to go in with the medium rust, which is this color here, sea sponge it. And then in little light sections, you're going to do light rust and sea sponge that. Notice though you don't go as heavy with the light rust. This is an eye attention getter, so you just need a little bit here and there. Okay. Now for different effects, like on this box, I wanted to add some like mud on the bottom. So I got a mud color monster mud, I popped it on the bottom. And then for green slime, green slime is really fun. You take a popsicle stick and you just kind of bat it on and then drop it down and it oozes down like slime. And then you do the same thing with bird droppings. And I use a popsicle stick. And then the magic step. Let me get that ready. There's my black paint. Okay, let's talk about dry brushing. I actually want to demonstrate it to you. <laughs> Dip it in, and dry brushing is exactly what you think it is. It's a dry brush, so you have to really dry it off. Who does dry brushing now? Isn't it awesome? Yes. It adds age to everything. The secret to dry brushing is that it will highlight the greatest areas. Let's remember my wet side so I don't get it all over the place. This is what's going to give the rust that depth and realism. You're going to start going across it like this. And you see how it all of a sudden now is getting that rusty look to it. So let's do it back here. And over here. And then the only thing that stops you is yourself because I'll keep going, you know. It's like you could rub it in and make like a smoke spot. And that's dry brushing. So of all the tips that I'm going to show you, dry brushing is, is really valuable. You can do it with silver like I did it. I've done it with white, and I'll show you on this tombstone here. It's a great technique. I'm going to pass this around so you can see that. I've got recipes on there for the ones that I've remembered. 
whenever I mix these monster muds together, I sometimes just do it on the fly. But a little tip with monster mud, when you get your sample paint at Home Depot and you mix it in with the drywall mud, it always lightens up, which sucks. So you have to kind of bring it back to where you want it to be. And so, you get artist paints. The difference between artist paints and what you get at Home Depot is pigment. You get a lot more pigment in artist paint, and so you don't start screwing up your 3 to 1 or 5 to 1 ratio. You can add little teaspoons and tablespoons of these. Like uh, this one is a brown. This is what I use for mud. It's called burnt umber. It's a great paint. And then raw sienna is almost a natural rust all by itself, so that's a good one. <laughs> I also wanted to mention, has anyone heard of tea staining before? Yes. All right, let's get around. Okay, tea staining is like really watered down paint. You can also tea stain anything. Like if you wanted to do this rusty eye beam and make it a little bit more like rain had eroded, do the same thing using a rust paint. And you use this raw sienna for the tea staining step. And I'll show you, I'll actually tea stain this tombstone so you can see exactly what I mean by tea staining. Final thing on rusting is called glossing. Glossing is you take, where is it? This is called high gloss varnish. It's an artist thing. It's just very high gloss clear paint. And you use this to add life to something. So anything that needs to have like a live look to it, wet, or what do you think on this box I want to gloss? Exactly. So what you do is you take this and you pop it on and it's going to have a nice wet color and it's going to dry exactly like that. Anything else you think I should gloss? Yeah, there we go. On the Hellhound? Oh yes, like uh, the eyes on. Uh, anyone see the Hellhound they did a while ago? Okay. That's cool. Wow. <laughs> well, his entire mouth is glossed up. His nose is glossed up. I even did his tear ducts. Anything where moisture would be. Now another thing I like to do with this kind of stuff. Here, I'll do it with this. Stand back. Go like that. Or maybe like a big sticky spot, that kind of stuff. This is great stuff. This is glossy. Okay. No, I'm going to buy one to deal with it. Okay, what questions do I have on monster mod or rusting? And I'm going to wait. What's the cost on the, the paint itself, the one for the more products? Great question. This stuff's cheap. <laughs> this stuff, it's called Basics. You can get it at Hobby Lobby. You can get it at Michael's. I'm thinking maybe 10 bucks for a jar. I don't remember exactly. But it lasts a really long time. They also sell them in tubes. But what I like about it, this is, you know how they have foofy, fancy artists paint? Well, we don't need that for Halloween. We just wanted to, you know, make some quick and dirty props. So they came out with this basic line. It's good stuff. So it's about 10 bucks a jar, if I'm remembering correctly. And it does last a long time. What other questions? How do you make the bulbs on the ivy? <laughs> oh, you guys, okay. Yeah. By almost losing all my fingers on my jigsaw is how I made the bulbs on the ivy. <laughs> I was like, okay, I want to cut these little hexagonal little things, and so with my two little fingers, oh, it was a bandsaw, I'm like this, ting, ting, cut it up while it's running, and then, that's how I made that, and then I cut a wooden dowel into slivers, and then glued that on the top of that. So. You could just use a knife and you do it out of the uh, pink foam? Well, it was a pink foam, and I was trying it with the knife, and it kept swooshing. Uh. So I was trying to get this cleaner cut. And then I thought, well, I'll do all, like a tube of it at the same time. I was trying all kinds of stuff. There's, there's a ton of better ways. I actually found a better way. I did uh, hot panels. This 
anyone seen the video where I did these giant haunt panels for the front of the garage? Yes. Okay. Well, that was a pain in the butt doing those bolts. So went to Home Depot and how many people go to Home Depot and, and just stare at stuff trying to ID? Like, <laughs> <you know? laughs> so I'm thinking, okay, there's got to be an easier way to make bolts. So can anybody guess what item? that I used at Home Depot that I just simply just stuck on it with pretty much like bolts, and they weren't bolts. PVC in caps. Ooh, that's a good idea. No, it wasn't that. If you saw the video, you know, I got a hundred in a bag for like five bucks. Tile spacers. Oh, yeah. It was so cool. No, these were round and had the X in the middle. Yeah, I know, it's cool. Okay, that's great. Do you have a YouTube channel for that or something? My YouTube channel? On the notes, you see in the right hand corner, I have on there uh, my YouTube channel, Scary Lady Videos. I couldn't come up with a name, that's the best thing I came up with, it was Scary Lady Videos. This is before Tara even came to be, so. Okay, so Fool the Eye, this is my favorite. What's this look like? Bullet holes. Bullet holes, rivets. Rivets. Yeah. Exactly. They can be whatever you want. A bullet hole would have more of a, like a rougher edge, but these were for rivets. And this is all done with airbrushing. This is completely an illusion. And how you do that? I have here step one, step two, step three. Step one, if you have an airbrush, oops, let me do it this way. If you have an airbrush, and you can also do this with a hand brush, with a really light hand. But say you have an airbrush, you do a white circle, a fuzzy white circle at the bottom. Then you do a fuzzy black circle at the top. Okay, so you got fuzzy white, fuzzy black. Then you got your stencil with a bullet hole that could be the shape of, or just a uh, eye had a rivet. And you put it right over the center, and you do white. Keep your stencil in place, and do a fuzzy black inside the stencil at the bottom. Keep it in place, do a fuzzy white at the top. And I think I wrote that down in the notes, so you don't have to like kind of try to keep up with that. And that's how you end up with rivets. And you can do bullet holes and that kind of stuff. This is great to finish off any kind of rusting technique that you have. Now, I'm always looking for airbrushing faux techniques. Anybody got one to share that they've done with their airbrush? Mostly just airbrush makeup. Airbrush makeup? Like shading? Yeah. yeah. Well, okay, like I just learned about shading with an airbrush. It's awesome because who has an airbrush? One, okay, not many. So you may want to consider an airbrush because of the shading. The natural technique of an airbrush is it's heavy in the center and kind of flushes out. Perfect for shading. And so anytime you want to shade a prop to make it look deeper is what you do is you imagine where the light source is. Like say the light source is coming from here to here. And just imagine if it was 3D, where would the shading be? It would be at the bottom on the opposite side. And you keep doing that, and pretty soon you're going to get the illusion of like a plank wall or something like that. Same philosophy going on with these rivets. If you look at it, the light source is coming from the top. And so it's highlighting the top of the rivet and the bottom of the dent. And then you have the black for the opposite side. All right, so I'm going to pass this around so you can take a look at it. Acetone. I love acetone. Now, who hates acetone? <laughs> Have, have you done it on pink foam and had disastrous results? <laughs> oh, oh, you actually had to use it for what it's intended? Yeah. That happens? <laughs> acetone, 
And if you want to add a full look to tombstones, don't be afraid of acetone. Acetone is what's in spray paint. And uh, it, people say don't ever spray paint a tombstone because it'll dissolve the foam, which is really true. It does in really cool ways if you control it. What I like to do now, what I used to do with acetone is I used to just use a big brush. Now I got this rounded, I don't know, pointy thing. And I dip it in acetone. And every one of your pink foam, like foam boards, always has faults or something like that in it. Because I learned with this new lavender pink foam, which sucks by the way, it's, I like the pink better because it reacted better to acetone with this lavender. You find a fault and you touch it with acetone, just like that, and it'll start dissolving. I didn't want to bring it here today. And you go around and find all your faults. So you'll start to learn to like the faults in your foam because it'll start dissolving in a beautiful way. If you go to an area where there's no faults, it just kind of sits on there for a while, unless you kind of go like this, and then you can hit it with the acetone. So I wanted to show you what you, what you can do with acetone once that dries and make it more realistic. If you look here, I had done a hole right here. So let's find a hole on this side. And see how that looks neat? Eh, kind of okay, but not really that realistic. So what I like to do, I have this pottery tool. One has a pokey karate and the other side is just like this flange or something like that. I like to go in and just kind of start poking away at it and dig it around and it starts looking like uh, centuries old damage to a tombstone or something like that. Like here, I'm noticing with the lavender you get the skin on it. You can just take that off and you start getting more and more crevices and holes and, you know. Hmm? <laughs> yeah, it won't heal, no. <laughs> but I like to dig on it. And then, let's see, oh, here's another one. Dig on that one. And then I like to take a wire brush and imagine, you know, like acid rain. Over the centuries, the pollution will start eating away at stones. So think about it like that and say, let's bring it down a little bit. And I'll let's bring my pokey prodi, kind of help it along. Scratch it down. And you start getting a bit more of a realistic look to it. Do some more here. Kind of help it along. And kind of be, you know, kind of free. <laughs> Just say, look, this is how it's going to end up. Scratch it. And then brush it. The sides are good to do that for. I did like a big gouging area. Really poked it out. And a little bit more lines there. Okay. So this is what I do to prep the tombstones to give it a centuries old look. I'm going to pass that around. Uh, pink foam. 
and to keep like, instead of getting the core or the you know the, the thick stuff, get the really thin and then just put the NDF in the middle. Okay, that's a good idea. Yeah, that's what I need. To be honest with you, I'm I'm starting to really warm up to this beanie foam. I call those white the beanie yeah. foam. I think it looks so much older, the tombstones. You have to work hard at the pink to get it to have a worn, old look to it. Whereas being funny, Actually, you don't have Mongo to do did one for me last year on the white foam. Mm -hmm. Did you do one yes or last year with the white foam? Yeah. Carved it, and I'll bring it in and have you guys look at it. Looks really uh, much older, looking like the uh, like the 1800 style. Uh, so and I never finished it out. Though. Yeah, and I'm also hearing that if you use a hot wire tool, that you can get more detailed cuts with the BD foam with a hot wire. When you start using other tools, they kind of just start flying off and all the Yeah, yeah, don't use that to tone with the white foam. I, I would, I would totally just use that brush and just. <laughs> <laughs> okay, with tombstones, you're looking at the very first tombstone I ever made, which completely sucks, and I'm embarrassed to even show it to you, <laughs> which is why it's cut in half now. <laughs> I've evolved a lot in my tombstone building. That is the um, sexiest tombstone ever. Oh, really? Thank you. Yeah. I guess, yeah, what sucks to you is you're crazy, right? <laughs> Well, let me tell you my new technique for doing tombstones. The last two that I did, I was I was really happy with the result. Uh, if you've seen my videos before, you probably have seen the old way, and this is the new way. Let's assume, because I didn't want to repaint a whole new tombstone. Oh, there's the white beetle. Let's assume that we just coated this with dry lock. Now, who can tell me the three awesome things about dry lock? Number one. It comes in a can. No. <laughs> it's water-based. Okay. And what else does it do? It It waterproofs. Yes. I love it. What else? Uh, it gives it a harder surface. Is it what? Harder surface. It, a much harder surface, and it has something in it. Grit and texture. Obviously, not a lot of people have used dry lock yet. If you haven't. Buy a quart size, buy a little one and give it a shot. Because you can also have it gray. So it does three things for me all in one stop. It paints the tombstone gray. It makes it waterproof. And it gives it a gritty texture. And it's, With, and it's what? You can tint it with any other latex paint. You can. You can tint like like a Lowe's. Other tombstones have the same color. Yeah, Lowe's doesn't carry the gray. Or no, no, Home Depot doesn't carry the gray. Lowe's does. So if you're stuck at Home Depot, you can ask them to tint it, and they'll tint it great for you. Or like an off gray brown to change it. Yes. Yes. It says right on the can it can be tinted. So if the guy goes, he can't tint it because they don't want to work at mixing it. I don't know. And I can tint it a lot of times. I'll put it to me. It makes a little, just a little and mix it with the hoops paint. Oh, okay, yeah. Myself, get different colors. Exactly. I actually might just buy a five gallon bucket. Oh, well, we don't <laughs> yeah. Okay, so let's assume that this has all been dry locked and it's, and it's dry. Now I'm going to do accent painting. If you've looked at ancient stones, you see a lot of lichen on there. And am I saying it right? Lichen? Okay, lichen. Lichen is kind of a rusty color. So I'm going to dry brush just a couple of pops on here. Because what you need when you're looking at a solid gray tombstone is you need to add some color to it, some interest. And so I popped in a little bit of this lichen color. And now I want to add some green, mossy kind of color to it. And this is my ugly green, glossy color. 
and that's made out of chromium oxide green or green, <laughs> chromium yellow or yellow, <laughs> and burnt umber, which is the brown. I love burnt umber. It's like such a natural color. <laughs> so I'm going to do the same thing, but more in a blotchy kind of thing. So I'm going to kind of put a couple of blotches. Now you're probably thinking, wow, that's like really vivid, but wait. There's more. And now my new way is I do tea staining two times. Tea staining is a, a neat mm -hmm. little thing where you just add some water and I'll mix them up. And I'm going to dry brush this first. <coughs> Break it around. I'm going to get away from the microphone here. 
Light, not heavy. And what it does is it takes the sand particles of the dry lock and just paint those white. And you start getting a lot more of a stone look. By the way, these rocks are made out of foam, too. <laughs> How'd you make the rocks? I chunked it, like like breaking ice. Just twing, twing, twing. You see that? Oh, yeah, really the rocks. <laughs> Not the best job, this is a pretty wet brush, but generally we dry brush this. Okay, so how many steps of tea stain have we done already? <laughs> How many steps of tea staining before the dry brushing did we do? Zero. Well, you did two. I had you pretend. That's why you don't remember. So, so we had done two tea staining, and then we did dry brushing. Now we're going to do real tea staining, and this is going to make a mess. <laughs> Let me move all this. Of all the questions I get, it's usually the tea staining. It's hard for people to imagine what I'm doing. So remember I showed you I put about a chunk of black into this water and mix it up. And I always like to try a hidden spot first to see how bad it is. Yeah, no, pretty good. Okay, this is going to be a, a dark one. I just pull. Start at the top and let, let weather like rain, if it was raining, let it drop down naturally. So I'm going to get away from the microphone and just tea stain this. See how it just goes where it wants to go? do it over and over again. Now the reason I do tea staining four times is because the first time that I do it, it's going to start muddying together. And you got to let it dry and that way your, your rivers of paint will find new paths. If it's wet, it just keeps finding the same path over and over again. Now this is black and what I'll do is I'll probably pretty much do this whole thing. Let's assume I did this whole thing, it's empty. And then you sop up the stuff that's on the bottom, put your brush, and put it back in. And then you do it again. <laughs> and you do it over and over again until it's all gone. But I want to add in a little bit more color variation. This is still kind of boring. So I'm going to add in hot stick. I'm going to add in a little raw sienna. Because I want to have this now a little bit brown. And a little burnt umber. And a little more water. Okay, now I got some color variations. I'm going to mix this up. Now assume this is dry and these are now taking new paths. And now you're going to see a browner look to it and to add some, a lot more variation. All right, here we go. It's subtle, but when it dries, you'll see it. I wish I did. 
It's not very time consuming, is it? <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you. <laughs> it takes it takes me about 20 minutes each round of tea staining, but I think the floor's worth it. That wasn't too heavy. Now normally I'd have to spill water on there. Okay, I tried an experiment. You tell me if it worked. Don't feel bad if you say it doesn't. But this was my new attempt at white lichen. Oh, it's pretty good. It does? Oh, okay. Let me tell you how I did it. <laughs> I just tried this yesterday. I was like, I don't know. Um, when when you're full painting stuff, it's what you got to do is see if you can find the real thing and just stare at it like kind of a zombie and go, all right, white lichen. And so I found some white lichen on a tree I had and I was staring at it. Uh, all right, it looks kind of flaky. It's got, let's see, white, cream, dark green, some black. And then I went inside the prop room and said, what can I replicate that with? And this one I used a, to a tissue paper and I dipped it in white paint. But I think next time I'm going to use cornflakes. Because I think it's going to give me a better texture. But what I did for this is I did tissue paper in, in the white, let that dry, and then came in with my favorite sponge. And I sponged on the what? The cream, the dark green, the black, and I started getting a texture that I liked. So there's a way to do like it. Oh, and the little pops of orange, that's actually on a tree. I was noticing the little pops of orange, so I, I made a little bit of orange in there. Okay. I like it too, like it. Okay, good. <laughs> trivia question. Let me get this out for you. <laughs> I love stencils. Stencils are a great sheet. They're really fast. And what do you think this stencil makes? That. Fire. fire. Very good. This actually makes fire. Now how do you do that? I can't show you today because I have an airbrush. <laughs> Say you want to have some kind of fire accent on something. You draw a squiggly line like this, and then you match it up with these little lines, and you just airbrush part of the curve, and then move it around and airbrush the other part of the curve, and move it down the other part of the curve. And then you draw another squiggly line in like, uh, I don't know, uh, orange, and then you do the same thing. And then you do it in uh, uh, yellow, and then a little bit of white, and you have realistic flames. It's hard for me to explain it to you, but guess what? There's some kick-ass YouTube videos out there that shows you how to make realistic flames. Just Google real or go to YouTube and put in realistic flames, and they'll show you how to do that. So you can add flames to anything. Even your bike in there. But also, there's stencils out there that we can use really fast. This one, what's this? Broken glass. Broken glass. Broken glass. So I would use, you know, if, if you had like some acetate, like uh, the transparency stuff, you can make a window out of that and then just lightly airbrush a white broken part to it. So, so look at stencils. It's the fun things that you find with stencils. So anybody else have stencils they use for their faux stuff? I can steal off you. <laughs> <laughs> like I've seen bullet holes. Yeah. I've seen spider webs. The bullet hole stencils? Oh, yeah, yeah, to cut them out yourself. They sell sheets and do that. Yeah, it's like really thick, transparent. Same plastic, yeah. Okay, yeah, so you can make your own stencils. So, you know, don't replicate it if you don't have to. <laughs> I just wanted to show this cool thing off to you. If you don't have an airbrush, here's an idea. It'll be really heavy in its paint, but you can get a little bit of an airbrushing technique for it. It's also good for full finishing. This is called a power sprayer. So it's just like a, a weed sprayer or a bug sprayer. You just kind of go like this and pop it up in pressure and it'll spray and it has different nozzles. A really fine sprayer, a really nice stream. 
And you can do that so like if you're doing a wall panel and you want to add some of the drip so you don't want to climb up on a ladder, just put some like watered down tea kind of staining paint and then just spray the top of it and then let gravity just kind of come down. So you just so this is called a full function power sprayer. It's pretty cool. I like it. Yeah. Right. Almost done. <laughs>
uh, a shadow purple color. And so now when I need a color, I look at it, all right, what, oh, here's a blood color, and it says I add one part white to three azalean crimson, and I got my blood color. So it's like a big sheet of colors. So this is a great recipe book for that. This is another version, which is it has the same colors on both sides. So say you had this artist palette of these colors. If I mix this color with this color, I get this color. If I mix this color with this color, I get this color. So it's another cheat on how you can mix your colors. Uh, a what? Yeah, gradient chart. Yeah, gradient chart, exactly. And you'll see, I don't know if you've realized this yet, but some colors, when you add other colors, they turn to mud. <laughs> so this helps you avoid that. And then I like to make my own sheets. <coughs> you know, when you take red and yellow and blue, you have the full color circle, but what are the colors in between? And so I made these little sheets where I blended them, and it's like a palette that I can refer to. And this one, I like cadmium red, and I also like azalean crimson, so I can look at, if I just change the red, what different colors I get. So I chose the palette. I made that for a bunch of stuff. All right. Okay, well, that is what I have to talk about with full finishing. Anybody have some questions that they can ask or some good ideas they have? Well, it's kind of off subject, but I was just curious that uh, devil dog that you did, the uh, demon yeah. dog, how long did it take you to do that? Okay, my hell, yeah, the hellhound? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, I made a hellhound if you haven't seen it yet. Um, I decided, I wonder if I could carve. Um, so I bought a truck full of pink starter foam. $226 worth, and I glued it all together, and so I had this giant block of pink foam. I know you're all jealous, right? It was like it was like paradise looking at all that pink yeah. foam. Okay, well, try to screw up the courage to cut it. <laughs> so my first cut, I went in oh so gingerly, you know, and you could barely tell what I laid off because I was so nervous. So finally, I had to dive into it, and I had a toy model, and I carved out. It ended up working, <laughs> and I carved out this demon dog. Unfortunately, when I got done with him, he looked like a giant naked cat, and I had to add some scales to him, and I don't know why, but I could not figure out the logic that God has with scales. They look simple. I couldn't figure out how to replicate it. How, he, how on a snake, how you get that beautiful uh, sheen to it, and, and it looks uniform, but it grows bigger and smaller. So I wasted a month of time with scales. All the pink foam, I cut it in a thousand ways. All together, it took me about two and a half months to make the demon dog. But uh, he's done now, and uh, he's getting ready to go out in the front of the yard, and I'm going to be out there with my shotgun if anybody just tries to kill him. Yeah. Uh, shotgun. Yeah. Shotgun. Okay, what time did you go first? I'll be right after. <laughs> She's got to reload sometime, right? That's right. <laughs> All right. What other questions or other people's faux ideas? Or okay, how do you keep the shop so clean? I clean it up every time. I cannot think in a mess. Like right now, this is I'm starting to get jittery. <laughs> Her OCD is kicking in. I'm constantly cleaning. I can't think in a mess. I can't see a dust bunny. Yeah, no. Yeah. It's, it's, I clean about three times during a session. I just, yeah. So I like it, it is all three times a lifetime. What? Unlike Pickle, he cleans his shop three times in a lifetime. Can, how do you find anything? He does. He organizes the butter. Collars up his kid. Yeah. Where's the house? I know exactly where every piece of tool is in my garage. Mine's hanging all on my wall. You should see yes. my property. I got, I got a headboard everywhere. Usually when I need something, he stubs his toe on. There it is. Did you I, talk about the uh, PVC pipe that you run up? Oh, yeah. Um, you know how, you know lovely Kansas winds? <laughs> Yeah, it's a blast. So uh, this was my cure for that. I, I read it on the forums. What they were doing is they were literally, uh, somebody would get a big, like, drill bit and then drill through there and put the PVC. Well, I like one and a half inch thick foam. And if you take two pieces, you got a three inch wide tombstone, which I think is a good width for a tombstone. And so what I do is I take the two halves and I put PVC on the inside of it and glue it all together and then rebar is in the ground, and I just 
slide this over and, and no problem after that with blend. It stays there. You may have also noticed the two little holes at the bottom of the plywood. I use tree stakes and twine and I tie them off on both sides and it's buried in the grass and you can't see it and neither can the burglars. So that they were going to try to steal it. He does the same thing. So he put the TV in there. Exactly. And then you sandwich it together and it holds it in. It's just right for half inch PVC. It's awesome. It's a great invention. Okay. What other questions? Or any of from my videos you had a question or something like that. I kind of got a lot of videos now. I just keep <laughs> making more. <laughs> what was it you said you put on the uh, poison tombstone, the lid? Oh, oh. You know how I was talking about the wonders of dry lock? Well, sometimes you don't want that grit. And uh, another forum member had mentioned, hey, Tracy, did you ever hear of Glenn Gripper? And I hadn't, and, and uh, she had used it for her, something she didn't want to have to grit. And where is it? Okay. It's like the most super duper primer you've ever seen. It has no grit, and so I glid and grippered this whole thing, and it just folds this beads in. It fills in really nice. So if you if you want like a dry lock waterproofy kind of thing, but no sand, glid and gripper. And I've just discovered it's an awesome glue for pink foam. White foam I'm hearing some people having trouble with, but for pink foam it's a good glue for doing the tombstones together. And it's cheap. You can get it at Home Depot. Some more full look to the erosion, like oh, 
Like, yeah, this is well, painted in dry lock, and I want to make this hole look even deeper, but I don't want it literally deeper. Yeah, remember, what what paint is space that black, I told you about? Black, black, black. Flat black. Okay, so I dip it in the flat black, and I would kind of do a couple of pops here and there, and that's going to give the illusion of a much deeper hole. And so I do that for, I call that detail shading. Same thing for like the cracks. You come in with the flat black and do the crack, a really thin line, and it makes the crack look even deeper and forever. Okay, good. Do you use the hot wire foam to cut your, you know, the white? Yeah, hot wire foam. Hot foam factory and wire yeah. cutter, is that what you use? I just, I just started using that. Um, they actually contacted me because they saw my hell horse that I made last year. It says, you know, you'd have a lot easier time if you used the hot wire. And so I started using it. Um, it is great for epitaphs. They're engraver. Really fast work. I mean, I just went right in. And then I was also able to literally, in like, carve. I carved this dead bird using it. Uh, I also have their industrial hot knife. Now that I used like crazy on the Hellhound because that was good for sculpting. When I was cutting out my tombstone, I didn't care for it very much when you're cutting straight cuts because if you just move a little bit and use that long hot knife, you get an angle cut and then they don't match up. I like the jigsaw, it's a nice 90 degree straight. So you just use a jigsaw? I use a jigsaw when I cut it out, but I do use the hot wire when I want to kind of shape because it's a little bit more weak. So, but I like the flexibility. Good question. All righty, well, I'm out of your hair. <laughs> Thank you.